Hello students, we're going to talk about protein function and we're going to use the example of hemoglobin, which is a transport protein. And I really love this example about how we um, get oxygen from our lungs into our tissue. It's a very interesting protein and it's going to bring together a lot of the ideas that we learned in uh, the rest of this chapter. So um, a key, some key terms and ideas are that a protein can bind what's called a ligand and it's going to have a binding site. Uh, later on, next chapter is uh, our enzymes. And in that case, the ligand is called a substrate and they bind in what's called an active site. But for now, we're in the first category of ligand in a binding site. The ligand has to be the correct shape. Remember, our amino acids all have shapes around them, uh, tetrahedral, um, mostly tetrahedral, some um, trigonal planar. Okay, so um, they have an overall geometry from all of those different shapes around each of the atoms. Um, and then the ligand also has to have a complementary charge and either a hydrophilicity or hydrophobicity. And um, so this is the idea that there has to be complementary um, interactions, either through van der Waals forces or hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole. Okay, so here's the idea that if you have a uh, protein and a ligand, they have complementary shapes and interactions. So um, one of the things though is, as we move forward, we're gonna try to move past these blob structures and think of them in terms of the amino acids that you worked so hard to learn and understand their properties. So this says enzyme, but that's next chapter. Really right now we're gonna be looking at what are called binding proteins. Okay, um, whether it's an, an enzyme or a binding protein, there's a thing called an induced fit where a protein and ligand, when they bind, the ligand um, and when it binds will create a conformational change in the protein. So it literally means that there's a mo movement or motion within that protein to allow for tighter binding. And so um, conformational change is a key term for the entire semester in biochemistry. We're going to see a lot of examples of it. Okay, so our first uh, protein that we're going to use as an example of this is myoglobin. And then we're going to expand to talk about hemoglobin. Both of them are oxygen binding proteins. Uh, why does oxygen need a protein? First of all, when we breathe oxygen in, imagine that in our lungs, that if we had to wait for it to diffuse through our bloodstream and our bodies, that would not be effective in getting oxygen to our muscles and brain uh, and other organs. So um, that's number one. Uh, oxygen's not water soluble. So in the blood, blood um, is polar, has a lot of water. So uh, oxygen is, is not uh, water soluble because it's nonpolar. Okay, now myoglobin is found primarily in muscle tissue. Uh, hemoglobin is found in the blood and they both contain similarities. So they have some very similar features and some big differences as well. So their main structural features that is the same as this heme group. It consists of what's called a protoporphyrin ring. And in that ring is an iron two. Now, this is so fascinating because um, one of the things here is a little bit different style of chemistry that I'm just going to highlight for you. Um, this is actually acid base chem, if you can believe it. The iron is a two plus, charge wasn't shown. And the iron two plus is an electron acceptor. The nitrogen actually has lone pairs on it, these nitrogen groups. The nitrogen with the lone pair uh, is an electron donor. And this is a style of chemistry called Lewis acid base. You probably heard of that in OCHEM because they talk a lot about this style of chemistry in OCHEM. Um, so the acid is the acceptor. So this is a Lewis acid. 
And this guy is the Lewis base, the nitrogen. And what it does is it creates a complex, okay? Now, one of the other very important things is that as we move on, that iron has to stay as two plus because that's what's going to accept oxygen, O2. Oxygen, here's the Lewis dot. And if you notice, it also has lone pairs. So it can also serve as a Lewis base. So as I, let me stop here for one second then. Lewis bases need lone pair electrons. Lewis acids are typically metal, transition metal ions that can accept them. Why? Because they have d orbitals that are vacant. Okay, so um, our oxygen, our O2, will act as a Lewis base. Now, for Fe2, we're going to see some pictures here in a moment. To grab onto that Fe2+, plus, uh, and oxygen to bind, um, the iron has to be in a 2-plus oxidation state charge, right? But one of the things that maybe you remember from uh, gem chem is that iron two can easily oxidize to iron three. How might you know that is that iron forms compounds either with two plus or three plus because it can go either way, very common. Both are common oxidation states. So the fact that iron two can lose its electron really easily is a problem because the Fe3 plus can't bind O2. So this particular Lewis acid base chemistry with the nitrogen ring clamping onto the iron two is very much there to keep the oxidation state as a two plus so it can bind oxygen. Okay, it's, it's protecting it. So um, this says it in words, you can read it. So iron, the iron must be two plus. The heme group is buried actually, and we're gonna see pictures within the protein so that it keeps the oxidation state two plus. What is also really interesting is that binding proteins have to bind tightly in the lungs, but they have to release oxygen in the tissues. Um, in the case of uh, myoglobin, myoglobin is mostly found in muscles. So we're going to come back to that here in just a second. But what's fascinating about these proteins is that these binding ones is that they have to have a mechanism to latch onto oxygen and let go of oxygen. Okay, so Let's take a look at the next picture. Uh, this is myoglobin. Uh, it has a heme group, which in this picture, uh, let's see if I can get a different colored pen. Let's see if the yellow is here. Okay, there's the heme group. If you notice what um, Secondary structure dominates are alpha helices. So there's actually eight of them. It has a very dense hydrophobic core. Um, and the heme group in there is flat. You see how it's flat? And the iron, the Fe2 plus in the heme, so what you wanna think of, let me change colors here. There's a picture next, but I like to draw it out here. The Fe2 plus, oh, it didn't let me, oops. Oh, I know, I need to switch colors. So the Fe2 plus, okay, had those nitrogens, 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 right? But what has to be anchored to a, to the protein itself? This is like a flat plane around here. Okay, let's think about which amino acid might have a nitrogen with lone pairs at pH 7.4. And the answer to that is histidine. 
it's the amino acid that anchors this to the, um, he, uh, the heme group. On the other side then is where the oxygen can come in and bind. So you see iron coordinated to porphyrin and H, this H is histidine. Okay, I think there's a better picture coming up. Oh no, I guess not. Okay, so um, I think it'll come up better in the, the hemoglobin pictures. Okay, so here's a very important graph for us. The myoglobin binding curve is um, showing us the relationship between structure and function of myoglobin. Myoglobin's function is to store oxygen in the tissues. To be released um, when you really need oxygen and strenuous muscle activity. So let's picture uh, that you have glucose. And the whole role is to make ATP. We're going to come back to this. We spent chapters on it. But what I want you to think about is if we have intense muscle activity, we need more ATP, which means that we're going to need more oxygen in that cell, in that muscle cell, to, um, to convert it to energy. So during strenuous muscle activity, the pressure of oxygen in the muscles drops. Okay, now let's look at the binding curve. What this means is that um, it's showing us the following. It's showing the percent saturation. I kind of like this side better. At high partial pressures of oxygen, uh, myoglobin is very, very saturated, 100%. As the pressure drops, it's still pretty saturated, right? In fact, even at um, a very low pressure, okay, even at low pressures, it's still 50% saturated. Okay, now what will happen though is that if you have intense physical activity, you're using up more oxygen, then myoglobin is going to be able to release oxygen during that time. Because if you notice, once the pressures get really low, there's a very intensely sharp drop in saturation level. So flipping kind of the idea is that myoglobin won't release oxygen unless you really need it during strenuous muscle activity. That's what this graph is showing us, okay? So, um, the actual curve is called hyperbolic, okay? It's this shape. And what it's showing us is relatively insensitive to small changes in oxygen concentration. What it means really is that um, if you look, the pressure's changing significantly, 60 to 40 to 20. They're, it's dropping, right? But it's still very saturated. It takes a lot takes a very low pressure for myoglobin to really start releasing that oxygen. And that's on purpose because it's in the muscle cells and it's there in case we need extra oxygen during intense muscle activity. Okay, um, this says everything that I said, uh, just if you want it written out in words. Um, okay, so pretty much, um, here, uh, myoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, an important characteristic for a protein that must extract oxygen from small amounts present in the blood. So it means that it can bind, it can get, keep that oxygen bound, have that oxygen bound to it, even when the pressure of oxygen is low.
okay? All right, hemoglobin has some similarities to myoglobin, except that it has four subunits. Each subunit is like myoglobin. Each one has a heme group. Um, and on this picture, the heme's kind of harder to see, but um, let's see. Uh, there's one heme group here, one heme group there, one there, and the fourth one's the one that I, I think, believe it's behind here. Okay, and so this is showing us that it has a structural similarity to the, sorry, to the myoglobin. Each has a heme group. Each one has that protoporphyrin ring, right, with the Fe2 plus in the center. Um, but in this case, um, you're going to have uh, four binding sites for oxygen. Okay. All right. So hemoglobin then uh, exists in two states. One is the R state, which has a high affinity for oxygen. The high affinity state, where would this be favored, is we want to think of this is our true transport protein. This one is going to be the protein that transfer uh, that it transfers or transports, I should say, oxygen from the lungs to the tissue. So in the lungs, I like writing it like this because you know I love equilibria. Okay, so. The binding of hemoglobin and oxygen, so here on the left side, they're not bound. On the right side, they're bound, okay? The equilibrium shifts depending on the pressure of oxygen. So I, I love this as an equilibrium discussion. If we increase the partial pressure of oxygen and that we have a high pressure in our lungs, we're breathing in O2, which way does Le Chatelier say this will shift? Well, you know your Le Chatelier's really well, so for sure it's going to shift to bound. Okay, so that's in the lungs. Now in the tissue, I'm going to switch colors. So in the tissues, oxygen is uh, being used, so this is being used right, for that reaction of glucose plus oxygen. So the pressure in the tissues, because of cellular respiration, the pressure of O2 drops. What does Le Chatelier say is it's going to shift to replace it, and you're going to go to unbound. Okay, so in this case, um, let's use the formal language, which with unbound, that's deoxy, deoxyhemoglobin, okay? And um, where is that state favored? This would be in the tissues. Now, so what's deciding which way it's going is the pressure of oxygen. So it is sensitive to pressure changes. Interestingly enough, um, what decides which way it goes with this pressure is a shifting, a conformational change. That's just a rotation of about 15 degrees. So here, the first one, deoxyhemoglobin T, this one uh, is favored in the tissues, right? Releasing. And this one is in the lungs. And if you look, you can actually see that they are subtly different in terms of a shift within that uh, molecule. Now, what's interesting is that when you're looking at this, because it has four subunits, um, we are now looking at um, a type of, of structure called quaternary structure, where the subunits interplay with one another. 
So not all proteins have quaternary structure. Uh, this is a great example. And the reason why something would have quaternary structure is to have it be part of its function. In this case, the subunits help to either grab onto O2 or release, depending upon the pressure. Okay, so here's kind of the mechanical part. What this is showing is, you see this histidine? So that's that histidine residue with the nitrogen. FYI, remember that pKa is 6.0 for that R group. So recall at 7.4, it's going to be deprotonated. And that's going to be a big deal always for histidine because it's going to have uh, effect all, it, it, it allows it to do a lot of chemistry within these proteins. In this case, the chemistry is Lewis acid base. So it's attached to the Fe2+. The oxygen binds on the other side of it. Okay, so um, iron is coordinated to a histidine. Okay, um, in the deoxy form without oxygen, the porphyrin is puckered and the Fe is out of the plane of the heme. So what's being shown here is that is the, what do you want to call this, blue? You see how it's puckered, what does that mean? It's more like a tent like that. Okay, when the oxygen binds, there's a, a, a conformational shift. And do you see what happens is the Fe2 plus flattens out and pulls it into the plane of the heme group. So you see how it goes from puckered to a plane flat. That pulls on the histidine, okay? So it pulls it down and then that is that dramatic, uh, I'm sorry, not maybe dramatic, but that's our conformational change. So if we go back to the previous picture, that's what causes it to change its look, okay? So when it's bound, the hemoglobin uh, heme groups are more flat and in the plane. And you can kind of see that in these pictures. It kind of really flattens it out. So this is a great example of a conformational change. And it's like a, the binding creates a movement of these amino acids and kind of changes, not kind of, does change the structure. It's a slight change but it makes all the difference in terms of binding versus not binding. Okay, the real um, important part about hemoglobin is that it has what's called cooperative binding. It has these four subunits. Each of them has a heme group. And when one binds, the next one binds, the third one binds, the fourth one binds. So this is the advantage of, um, of quaternary structure. Quaternary structure allows um, the uh, binding of one subunit to alter the other one's ability to bind, okay? This produces a curve that is different and it's called a sigmoidal curve. So here's the curve for hemoglobin. It's sigmoidal. See, it's S-shaped. Okay, what this means is that as the pre oxygen pressure drops, as we go from the lungs to the tissues, and this one for myoglobin is not so great because it's a lot more uh, uh, pronounced on this side, but as we go from lungs to the tissues, um, the percent saturation, it's a much more dramatic drop. And what happens is that this is what you want for a transport protein. You, you want that in the lungs that it favors 
the bound state and then so that's in the lungs and that in the tissues it's going to go the other way because of the pressure difference and then the other part is that as um, the hemoglobin releases oxygen in one subunit then the next one goes the third one goes the fourth one goes so that is that cooperative binding okay and that is possible through um through structures that have four independent subunits and that is a an example of quaternary structure this picture is a lot better Okay, this picture is a lot better um, than the other one. So what this one's showing is that you have a very big difference between um, myoglobin and hemoglobin in terms of pressure sensitivities. So at high pressures, like there would be in the lungs, they're both bound well with oxygen. So you have a high percent saturation. But as they move, as the hemoglobin moves to the tissues, it begins to release oxygen. Now, give me one second to look something up real quick because I'm thinking, I don't want to misspeak, so give me one sec, okay? Um, you can pause me right now. Okay, so in... Um, in the capillaries of active muscles, so that's the number that I was I was thinking it was 26. So it's it's around that value. So um, at around 24, that is active muscles. So normal activity. If you notice, uh, hemoglobin is uh, less than 50% saturated. Here at around 26 tor is where you have the 50% saturation, and then even lower, it starts to release even more oxygen. Do you notice how different that is, though? If we read, let's say, 26 tor and across, myoglobin is a lot more um, um, it has a higher, it has a well, okay, how would I say this? Let me back up that at um, the pressure in just a normally active muscle, hemoglobin is releasing more oxygen, whereas myoglobin has more of it bound. To get myoglobin to start really releasing it here, you have to go to a very low pressure. Okay, and that's the whole point, is that myoglobin is there to release oxygen during very strenuous muscle activity, whereas myoglobin is dropping it off during regular activity. Okay, so kind of to recap is that um, the pressure at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated is around 26 torr, and that's around normal active muscle Whereas, um, whereas myoglobin at 26 tor, it's way up here, very saturated. To get myoglobin to only be 50% saturated, the pressure has to drop significantly, which will happen in strenuous muscle activity. Why, why is there a difference? because hemoglobin has quaternary structure. Okay. Um, some things affect hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. Two things, carbon dioxide and H plus. 
So from our discussions for the, from the last test, for sure, here's our reaction that we talked about a lot. Okay. Um, oops, I skipped the H uh, carbonic here. Let me rewrite it. Skipped a step there. Okay, so here's our muscle activity. Conversion of glucose plus oxygen to CO2 and water to make ATP. That means during muscle contraction, you're going to have more higher partial pressure of CO2. As we discussed previously, that's going to shift these reactions to the right and make the bloodstream more acidic. Now, this is really interesting because that's going to affect our other equilibrium. So there's our equilibrium of hemoglobin, bound and unbound. And what's going to happen, we have pictures in a second, is this acid, this H+, is going to bind to the hemoglobin that's bound to oxygen, but that's going to be at an allosteric site, meaning not the binding site, not the heme. The other thing that can bind is carbon dioxide. And what does this do? is that it creates conformational changes so that the iron shifts, the heme group shifts, and then releases oxygen in the tissues. And this is called Bohr effect. Okay, Bohr, this is uh, the father of Niels Bohr, the one from the jumping uh, electron business. Niels Bohr is probably my favorite scientist. Um, this is his dad. They were a brainiac family. They both won Nobel Prizes. Um, so this is really, really interesting because it ties into what we learned this last section. So I really like it, which is that as the blood gets more acidic, the H plus will now bind to hemoglobin that has O2 bound. CO2 binds to it as well, and it forces the equilibrium uh, in this, the way I've written it, to the left, which means that oxygen is released. Okay, so conversely, when carbon dioxide levels in the blood decrease, that's in the lungs, right? When we're breathing out CO2, then the reverse process happens that uh, it increases oxygen's affinity for the protein. So here's a nice picture, same one I was trying to draw. Now I will say this, this one's backwards from how I drew it, but it's still okay, um, which is that here's our bound hemoglobin, okay? H plus from metabolism, CO2 from metabolism binds to it and causes it to release oxygen. Okay, that would be in muscle tissue where you have it actively metabolizing sugar for energy. And then in the reverse direction in the lungs, um, the CO2 <clears throat> is, uh, is leaving, right? Because we're breathing it out and that's gonna shift it to binding O2. Okay, so that's Bohr effect. And this is all due to conformational changes. Okay, so um, just a summary chart then. Um, in the lungs, the lungs have a higher pH. CO2 is being released. Okay, 
CO2 is escaping, right? Leaving because we're breathing it out. That raises the pH. And then hemoglobin binds oxygen. At in the tissues, the uh, lower pH is due to the production of H plus. Hemoglobin releases oxygen, and that's because the H plus is binding, so that acid is binding. Okay. Uh, all right. Here's a proof of that. These are percent saturations for hemoglobin at different pHs. So this is how they prove this, is that at different pHs, as the pH plummets, drops from 7.4, let's say, to 6.8, um, the lower the, the, I'm sorry, the lower the pH, the higher the acid level, the more oxygen uh, hemoglobin will release, okay? Because the H plus is gonna bind and cause the release of um, <clears throat> that oxygen. This is the, um, the, the nitty gritty. This is the nitty gritty of why and how that happens. Let me check if we have a, a better pick on that. No, okay, so we'll go and use this one. Okay, so what does this mean? Is that, do you see here where it says added protons? This is a proton then in eight, H plus, right, for when you have high amounts of CO2 in the tissue, that H plus is going to protonate a histidine residue. Okay, that histidine residue, here's histidine, this is that nitrogen with a pKa of 6. So it's deprotonated. However, now, with that lone pair, it can act as a base. So that, that histidine acts as a base, and it grabs that H+. With the proton added, the charge on that goes to positive. So I'm going to highlight that, that ultimately, when it's added on there with the added proton, that goes to plus. And what that does now is creates an attraction to aspartate that, remember aspartate is deprotonated, its pKa uh, is lower, right? Much lower, like 3A something, okay? And that now, that has a negative charge and we have what's called the formation of a salt bridge. And that salt bridge formation changes the structure of the hemoglobin so that um, in a more acidic environment, that little shifting of them coming together because they're attracting um, favors the letting go of O2. So that is favoring the release of oxygen. Okay, all right, um, and I love that because now you're kind of going to get a feel for why it was so important to understand the um, pKa's of these residues. So histidine always has a deprotonated nitrogen because its pKa was 6.0. That allows it to be a base at pH 7.4. So it grabs that excess acid from excess CO2 that's reacted with water to form an acid. And now with that added on, that proton added, uh, the lone pairs are now bound. So we could erase those if you'd like to do it like this. We'll erase the lone pairs, the blue is the N. Now you have a plus charge and it's attracted to a negative charge. And those guys attract to form what's called a salt bridge. And now that is an actual physical shifting because they are attracting each other. And that shifting uh, creates a conformational change that favors the release of oxygen. CO2 does something a little different. 
what CO2 does. It also binds uh, to the hemoglobin, but it binds at the amino terminus, the N terminus, and forms what's called a carbamate. Fascinating here, Kim, is that the amino terminus, as we've learned, is plus. When it binds this, you literally change it from a negative to a positive end. That has major repercussions in terms of attractive forces. And then again, that little shifting that goes on favors the release of oxygen. So I really love this slide because it's the nitty gritty of the chemistry that you've invested to learn about their PKAs, charge, understanding their residues, what they're like. And it's really showing you how it actually affects things in a protein. Both of these binding events allow for the release of oxygen in the tissues. The other part, please keep in mind, this is not in the heme group. This is out on the on different spots within the proteins. This is not in the binding site, okay? Okay, so that's a summary. 